Welcome back. So, in previous lecture, we talked about uh, the the fracturing of the crust and uh, the emission of the redon gas, the reduction in the velocity of P wave, and then after uh, the filling up of the crust, the velocity was regained to normal, as well as subsidence and uplift. And we discussed one case of Nagata, where uh, the or the uplift was um, uh, observed for more than 60 years. Now, there is another evidence uh, which was been observed in 1802 earthquake of Japan. So, in the morning before AD 1802 earthquake, the sea suddenly withdrew by about 300 meters, and this was because of the pre seismic that is earthquake uplift. So, pre earthquake uplift was uh, resulted that resulted into the withdrawal of sea. Now, in 2004 Sumatra Andaman earthquake, uh, this phenomena was observed and experienced by few people, but we were we were not aware that such phenomena uh, is related to an uh, occurrence of a big earthquake. So, that killed a lot many people. And after 4 hours, this is for the 1802 earthquake, a large magnitude earthquake struck the region uplifting the land by another uh, meter or so. Now, this 1 meter uplift is too large actually and this was also observed and not 1 meter, more than 1 meter in northern part of Andaman island, whereas in few locations the area subsided probably will talk this when I'm, I'm give, I'm, I'm going to uh, give a lecture on, on tsunamis. Before an earthquake, there is consistent decrease in the electrical resistivity. This is another important parameter which people have tried to understand or tried to uh, record and also the magnetic field locally become very strong such changes can help in locating the hidden faults in the area also. Constant watch on groundwater chemistry is an another parameter which helps in predicting the earthquake. It has been noticed that inert gases like helium, argon, radon are released prior to an earthquake. Detailed geological or geomorphological mapping of active landforms and precise geodetic measurements can help in determining which segment of the fault will rupture or slip in future. So, this can be done if you are doing a very detailed geomorphological investigations and where we can identify the active landforms. So, we know that which area is prone to earthquake and where is the likelihood of uh, uh, this slip to occur in near future that will be your earthquake. So, this is an important uh, studies which we have been doing. So, active fault map and studied in detail should be classified on the basis of their seismic potential. All magnitude earthquakes small, moderate and large should be plotted on detailed geological map with all information of structure and geology as well as active fault etcetera to get complete map for hazard evaluation. So, this involves lot of uh, uh, layers of your map or thematic maps you can say ok. Right from the historical seismicity you can talk you can discuss with the modern seismicity including, including your micro, uh, moderate and large magnitude earthquakes if at all they are experienced because large magnitude earthquakes will be very few, but moderate and small magnitude you can come across as well as the geological structures which have been marked 
or identified mapped and geomorphological uh, uh, signatures of past earthquakes should be mapped and that will give you a complete understanding that this area is prone plus you one can do the paleo seismic investigations to understand that whether this fault is capable of triggering large magnitude earthquake in near future or not along with that the uh, if you incorporate or complement the gps studies then you will be doing the best job in terms of hazard evaluation and also you can also predict the the, uh, the near future earthquake uh, in that particular region now history of earthquake hazard assessment in india if you take quickly the earthquake hazard assessment study started in india after the occurrence of 8.6 assam earthquake in 1897 now this earthquake is also been termed as shillong plateau earthquake before this oldham published a catalog covering the earthquakes those believed to have occurred in india from early times to 1869 ad later geological survey of india under the leadership of again r d holdham started publishing memoirs of gsi giving detailed account of damage observations so because, because earlier the because of the lack of instrumentation mainly the records of past earthquakes were been studied using the damage pattern and based on this you can generate the iso seismic map we still do that but most now we have in most of the areas we have uh, well placed uh, seismographs so we can we can use that data so the first seismic zonation map of india and demarcating three zone heavy moderate and light was prepared by the geological survey of india in 1934 and this was on the basis of uh, the occurrence of bihar nepal earthquake this was in 1934 the it was a large earthquake in uh, close to the uh, india nepal border uh, that was termed as bihar nepal earthquake in 1934 in 1962 the bureau of indian standard bis then indian standard institution issued the first code that is a building code of practice for earthquake resistant structure design this included the first comprehensive seismic seismic zoning map of india and that was based on multidisciplinary approach now usually uh, when such maps are prepared the past seismicity that is historical seismicity the ongoing seismicity the damage pattern and the geological structures are taken into consideration and even the active faults are taken into consideration to come up with the uh, the seismic zonation map and the most important is the ground acceleration so if the ground acceleration data is available you will understand that which area will have uh, the maximum intensity of ground shaking as compared to the another one because that helps in protecting the civil structures because earthquake will not kill the people but the structure will kill the people so this is the saving the structure is is very important protecting the structure and building the uh, the civil structures with proper codes proper building code is extremely important because then those structures will be able to sustain themselves at the time of peak ground acceleration or the ground shaking so the map was based on the data on shapes of isoseismal this isoseismal are been prepared considering the the damage pattern so isoseismal for important damaging earthquakes the epicentral map and the tectonic of uh, tectonic of the that is the structures tectonic structures of the region so this was been taken into consideration uh, for preparing the uh, seismic zonation map so if you look at the uh, the variations or the transformation of different uh, 
uh, maps which are been listed here A, B, C, D and this uh, where over the time uh, were been changed or modified or we can say updated based on the, the information which we kept on getting. So, earlier they were more than 5 zones then they reduced to 5 and lastly what we see now is your only 4 zones because the effect uh, of uh, the, the seismic shaking was observed different as compared to what it was been observed in the past. So, the Indian seismic zonation, zone, zonation maps since 1962, the first edition was in 1962, then 1966, 1984 and then 2002. Now, this was after the 2001 Bhuj earthquake. So, now we no more have the zone 1 which was been seen here, this white part is all like uh, the zone 1. So, this zone 1 is not available, this remains the same which are the, the red part is zone 5. And this is of course, this is quite surprising that uh, a small patch here which is sitting away from the uh, this active seismic zone is under zone 5, because this is of uh, like it has ex this region has experienced or the region has been struck by uh, major earthquakes like 18, 19, 11 and uh, the uh, 2001 Bhuj earthquake, whereas this of course, is remains in zone 5, because it is along the subduction zone. Here. So, now from uh, before 2001, we were having zone 1, zone 2, 3, 4 and 5, but now we are having only zone 4 starting from zone 2 to zone 5 zone 1 has been removed. So, this was after 2001 Bhuj earthquake. Now, seismic zoning main aim of regional seismic zoning and micro zonation is to reduce the seismic hazard, which helps designing earthquake resistant structures. The seismic zoning map includes information like zones indicate the degree of hazard which may be caused by seismic activity in particular region and in micro zonation we also consider the particular site of interest. Okay. It includes information of instrumental data and historical records, active tectonic structure, peak ground acceleration at particular point of interest at a particular area. So, these are the seismic zonation uh, uh, showing the uh, seismic zonation map showing the intensity uh, the different areas will experience. Okay. But now, as I, I would like to mention that the Ministry of Earth Science and in particular the National Center for Seismology has taken up a job and uh, that a big project which will uh, have the with an aim to go for micro zonation of 30 cities in India and mostly most of the cities will be close to Himalaya and in this region as well as in this region, but m many cities will be here because they are sitting in and very loose uh, sediments. This was one of the exercises which we did, but I would not say that this is in particularly uh, uh, um, complete one, because whatever the data was available, we did this exercise to understand that which areas will have more of ground acceleration. Now, need of paleoseismic studies, as I have been mentioning in many of my lectures, the driving force behind most paleoseismic or the ancient uh, earthquake studies is society's need to assess the probability and severity of future earthquakes. Deadly earthquakes have occurred in 1999 in Turkey, killing almost 17,000 people in 2001 in India, killing about 20,000 people 
in 2003 in Iran, 31,000 in 2004 in Indonesia, and this was the this Sumatra Andaman earthquake, which took lives of more than 2.5 lakh people from tsunami as well as the earthquake. In 2005, Pakistan earthquake killed, or you say the Kashmir earthquake, almost 80,000 people. And in 2008, Sichuan earthquake killed 69,000 people. 2015, almost 9,000 people. And this was one of the reasons that we have discussed in the past uh, in one of the lectures when I was talking about the Gorkha earthquake. So this was this is the isoseismal map of Gorkha earthquake 2015 and the reason was the energy or the acceleration which was observed was not similar to what it was observed in most of the earthquake of similar magnitude. So the, the time period as well as the, uh, the acceleration was not similar to what it was been observed in like Northridge, Kobe, Loma Petra, Imperial Valley earthquake. This was, was like a swing which came and moved the surface. So further in 2000, like 2004 Sumatra Andaman earthquake was the fourth most deadly earthquake in human history and the strained worldwide relief capacity. It was really a very, very damaging earthquake. Of course, after this earthquake, the Japanese people were quite alert to understand that similar magnitude earthquake can occur in that area and in their region and that happened in 2011 Tohoku earthquake. Now with the exception of Turkey's event, this earthquakes occurred on fault that have that had not generated the surface rupturing earthquake during historical times or being studied by paleoseismological. However, even where paleoseismologists have pointed out potential dangerous fault, local government have often not used that information to increase public awareness of seismic hazard or mitigate the effect of future earthquake. This uh, of course has been uh, uh, very important that whatever the information has been generated from paleoseismic investigation, the local government should inform the, the people in that area or you can increase the people awareness because they should not construct the houses on that particular fault line. Earthquake risk can damage the earthquake risk from a particular earthquake will occur close to where we leave depending on whether or not tectonic activity that caused the deformation is occurring within the crust of that area. The risk is greatest in most tectonical areas that is near to plate margin and plate boundaries. So this is very clear that we know that where in India we are going to expect a large magnitude earthquake that is of course is the Himalayan front. Occurrence of earthquakes in area other than the plate boundary that is away from the plate boundaries are not well understood and this is what has happened when we had an earthquake of 2001 Bhuj because it is the area is sitting away from the plate boundary and we consider that area as a stable continental region and even the, the Latur earthquake which was sitting in the cratonic area. But if the earthquake have occurred before in that region based on the historical data or the paleoseismic study if you know then one can expect that they will occur again in that particular region. So earthquakes do not kill people, buildings do because most damage will be to the buildings during an earthquake. Earthquakes located in isolated areas far from human population are not going to affect us and they are not 
posing any sort of an hazard or risk to uh, to us if it is going to occur in a in a remote area and that what happened in 1819 uh, earthquake of Allahabad in Kutch because it it took place in a remote area where not much people were affected so this is another important point even with the uh, moderate magnitude if you are having the population is high you will end up having more damage and more people getting affected because of that thus in earthquake prone areas strict building codes should be followed for the design and construction of buildings and structures that can withstand the large earthquake and reduces the death toll damage from earthquakes can be classified as follows ground shaking okay. that is shaking of ground caused by this is what we were talking about the uh, the liquefaction okay. the intensity of ground shaking depends on the distance from the epicenter and on the type of bedrock or the material on which you have constructed your uh, structures loose unconsolidated sediments will be subjected to more intense ground shaking than the solid bedrock damage to the structure depends on the type of construction okay. so if you are having machinery structures you are, are safe but of course you need to follow uh, the building codes okay. now this is an example of uh, from taiwan uh, the, the rupture passed through this area and this the adjacent house was as it is but this got damaged because this was been constructed on the uh, the fault line so this is from taiwan 1999 chichi earthquake example the landslides are from 19 uh, 2000 2005 uh, muzaffarabad earthquake uh, this is a fault scarp uh, from uh, the epicentral area where the rupture took place 2005 Muzaffarabad earthquake the white part which you see here are all the roof of the houses and this house which is sitting on the hanging foot wall survived whereas all the houses which were sitting on the false scarp this is what we call active uh, uh, tectonic landforms so this is the fault scarp, scarp which is of course uh, uh, quite a bit high uh, that that means that this was this fault has triggered earthquake in the past also so this was not in the one go the height which you see here but it was during the multiple earthquakes so this is another uh, an, uh, example or the lesson which has been taught by this earthquake of 2005 that we should avoid constructing the houses on the fault scarps or close to the, the fault scarps okay, or on the on the fault line so uh, the geological hazard related to earthquakes in total if we take we can have a number of ways even if you are sitting close to the fault line close to the plate uh, boundary or you are sitting away from the plate boundary so for example volcanoes tsunamis landslides liquefaction these are all uh, the secondary effects which can uh, which can which should be taken care of and should understand uh, that this areas would be prone to uh, such type of hazards because of strong ground shaking or because of the subduction which is going on volcanic eruptions can also be uh, uh, can also be triggered because of the great earthquake so these are the examples of landslides the rapid mass movement processes and the lahar flow if you are having a volcanic eruption you can uh, get into the lahar flows in the region this is a recent uh, 2018 uh, landslide which was been caused in Hokkaido region the magnitude was not much uh, in terms of uh, like 6.7 only but 
a massive landslide was triggered. If you look at the, uh, the complex uh, feature of this, this photograph is before uh, the earthquake and this is after. So, it was a complex landslide which was been triggered. The reason was the material and the, the, the hills in this area, all the hills uh, were uh, uh, like over saturated we can say because before an earthquake there was a spell of very heavy rain because uh, caused by the storm in that region which resulted into a massive landslide just uh, with a magnitude of 6.7. So, liquefaction is the commonly uh, uh, observed phenomena even if you are sitting away from the uh, uh, the epicentral area, even the tsunami can travel thousands of kilometers. It can be transoceanic from one ocean to another ocean. It can travel if you are having a, a mega earthquake along the subduction zone. And so, th these are the two things which can also be seen in addition to the, and then you can have fire, which is a secondary effect. So, the earthquakes occurring in evening, in, in night, will have different scenario in terms of the damage and the life loss. Natural gas line ruptures, okay, problems in the compounding, compounded by water lines, you may have if you are having the, uh, the breaking up of the dams or maybe uh, breaching of the, uh, your uh, canals, water canals can result into a local flooding. And this is an example of 1906 earthquake in San Francisco, more than 90 percent of the damage to the building was caused by fire. So, these are the, the important parameters which are secondary effect which we feel are very trivial, but we need to take into consideration. So, final what we do the risk assessment includes I mean, what type of hazards we are looking at, the zonation map. And then we take into consideration that how what what are the activities and the people will be affected. Okay, so the persons will be affected, number of persons, structures, activities, and functions. And then this information we take as an an element at risk. Okay, here then the vulnerability of assessment based on this will give a final input here in with an inclusion of human vulnerability that how many people are going after the structures vulnerability, land vulnerability and function vulnerability. And finally, you can talk about the risk assessment of the area. So, you need to have many information and this is the information which usually is required to go for micro zonation. So, you take into consideration the building inventory, topography, seismicity, faults in the area, soil characteristics, hydrology that is the groundwater condition and then do hazard analysis and prediction in modified Mercalli scale that is an intensity and collateral you, you can put into the intensity in PGA, the damage scenario and then finally, you are talking about which includes the vulnerability uh, analysis and then you can come up with a damage scenario, what will be the, how much area will be affected and what, how many people will be affected because of this event. So, I will close this here and we will continue in the next uh, lecture with a new topic. Thank you so much.